All right, hello everybody and welcome to the dedicated show. We're doing this a little bit differently today. We have a very special guest that I've personally been talking to for probably three, four, maybe even five years at this point on a very regular basis. And his name is Andreas Kretz. Uh, he's in charge of Learn Data Engineering. And today we're gonna talk about both of our entrepreneurial journeys. We'll talk about how we got started, how we built our personal brand, what we actually do for a living. We'll talk about some of the tools, technology that help us run our business, some challenges. We'll talk about our favorite parts of running a business. And we will happily take as many questions as we possibly can from the audience. All right, I think as a step one for this, let us know where you're tuning in from. And for you, Andreas, I think it'll be great if we get started by learning a bit about you, who you are, and what do you do? Yeah, hi everybody. Let's see a few comments in the chat. Yeah, my name is Andreas Kretz. I'm from Germany. I live here with my wife and the two kids, and I'm a data engineer I'm coming from the computer science field. And I got into data engineering over time. Back in the day, I did my computer science diploma here on a, a University of Applied Sciences, and then I got a job. And I was working as a computer scientist, let's say, and working on a problem where I was actually stumbling on top of problems that I couldn't solve with what I have learned in, in university or in school. And this was then the, the era of how I got into big data and how I then used that for my project at work to, yeah, to advance this and to make this a success. I'm doing this here with social media and YouTube and so on almost six years now. And as Kate said, I think we, we met one year in, we met on a live stream uh, with a few other people. So yeah, that's how I got here. And yes, know, awesome. Kate. Thank thank you for sharing that. And I know you have a, a really cool story of going for working for, for a company and then eventually figuring out you want to take on this journey of, of being an entrepreneur, of being a business owner, and we'll get into how you made that decision. And if this is for everybody, or maybe it, it's not for everyone, we can get into that. Mm -hmm. I'll briefly introduce myself and tell the audience a little bit of some background in terms of how I personally got started with Dedicated and my own little brief history here. So for those who don't know me, I'm Kate Stashney. I am the founder of Dedicated and my past really is, is not really a data science background or anything like that. I studied finance and then I went into selling risk management training when I graduated in 2009, got into working for a bank in risk management, risk analytics. Then I transitioned into a consulting role helping out financial services institutions with regulatory compliance and uh, risk management and some uh, getting into sort of operational risk right before I had my first child, which really motivated me to find a work from home role about eight years ago. I always look at the calendar. I'm like, how old is my oldest child? Okay. She's almost eight. This was about eight years ago that I got into learning about the data space because the role that I was, that I took on was actually a data insights and analytics strategy manager. And it was my first introduction into the space of data. I was given a data set. I was given Tableau software to work with, to pull some insights and create some data visualizations. And it was truly love at first sight between me and uh, data visualization. And now fast forward to 2022, I run dedicated, which is a, it's a company that's focused on a couple of different things. We run the dedicated conference dedicated media partnerships with customers that want to reach their audience on LinkedIn or build a stronger brand or be recognized for thought leadership on LinkedIn or other platforms. And then I have this dedicated community in, it's called the dedicated circle. So that's a bit about me. And today we're here with Andreas to really answer any questions that people might have, offer advice, share more about our background that I think not everybody comes out there and shares their thought process of why did I do this versus this and sort of the evolution, because we do have one thing in common. We keep trying to try new things and evolve That's the true. business as, as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. What 
I think what I forgot to mention now, how I actually, or that fits very good to, to what you just said, how I got here. Right now I'm running a I'm running an academy for data engineers. So I'm teaching data engineers, but that wasn't actually how I started. Like this, this was basically never the plan. <laughs> right? I just started for fun. Okay. What to do? Share your ideas, share your knowledge online with, with people. So yeah, that's interesting because that's exactly how I started my business. I didn't even know I was starting a business. I didn't even know I was building my personal brand, but similar to you, I was sharing content. I think it was probably 2017 or so when I really started posting on LinkedIn. And I think it was similar for you, Andreas, where that's also around the time that we met and took part in the data science office hours with Kristen and Terry and I think Eric Weber and Sarah and Bo Sorry. Walker. And I think Matt Dancha just joined as well before we disbanded and ran into <laughs> <Before you> left. <laughs> Yeah, it was like a week after. But that was really cool because yeah. it was the power of community where we all got on our weekly calls or biweekly calls and were able to have conversations and yeah. sharing content because we wanted to, not because it was a but because it was something that we in, truly enjoy talking about and I, and I still do, which I'm sure yeah. you do as well. I think that's also a, a top tip for somebody. Why to do this, start and just do it for fun. Start, share your ideas, share your knowledge, do it for fun. Don't go too serious. What I had in mind when I started it, it was actually something at work where I got uh, to, or, I was at an interview with someone and this person said, well, if I leave my current job, I basically leave all my reputation. Nobody knows me in the new company. So it's not really good. And that was for me, that, that starting point where I said, huh, might be a good idea to share what you know, and to, to build like an online profile to make, to build a, a, a community to build a, a academy just yeah. to position yourself as an expert and show out of yeah because of, it's fun show what yeah. you can do <laughs> yes and i remember because we were having so much fun we both got the linkedin top voice in data science and analytics mm -hmm. i believe the first one was 2018 and then we both got it again in 2019 and i remember I was personally pretty shocked. I'm like, wow, I, I talk about this stuff all the time. I don't think I'm an expert by any means. You know, I'm just, I was really in that yeah. stage of learning and sharing everything I learned. How did you, what well, sort of, what was your reaction when you found out that you were on the list? I don't know. It, it was very strange, as yeah. you said, because the, this was never the goal and we, we were just talking about what, what was fun. I think also we were very early. I, I, the, these were the early ones where the whole data science space was very fresh on LinkedIn. Um, yes. And I think LinkedIn, it was also pretty fresh in terms of putting content on the platform. I think still the majority of the population doesn't know that you can actually share content on LinkedIn because they think when they think social media, and whenever I read books on the, on the topic, they mention, oh, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Pinterest, I'm like, Where's LinkedIn? You guys are missing the most important one because for me, that that has been my my favorite social media platform. It's it, I think mainly because people act a lot more professional on there. They know that their colleagues might be watching. They're using their real names. They're using their real photos for the most part. But what's your what's your favorite social media platform? I have two. I have yeah. LinkedIn. And I have YouTube. I actually don't know why I started back in the day on LinkedIn. I have no idea. Like why? I just, I don't know. It, it, but for everybody who's watching, I think we, you pointed that pointed them in the right direction. LinkedIn is the best platform to start for your professional profile. Oh, you're stuck, Kate. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. I got you. Yeah, you were frozen. Like LinkedIn oh. is the professional, the best platform for professional sharing of knowledge yes. because people are looking for this. They are usually coming there for the purpose of their work, right? 
you're not sitting in the evening over LinkedIn and now oh, let's look what the newest memes are or something like it's, it, but it's, it's a good platform for this. And yes. so I would also suggest people to go here and, and start to share with their. So you don't remember why you started. I actually do remember. So quick backstory back when I was still in selling risk management. So this is my first job out of undergrad. I just graduated. I'm like 21 years old getting started. And I was told to create a LinkedIn account. Okay, sure. Whatever to put my resume on there, which I, I guess the majority of people that I know who are not like tech people, they still think LinkedIn is a place to put your resume and that's pretty much it. We were trying to sell risk management training to banks. And at that time it was pretty easy to directly message somebody on LinkedIn, as long as you were in the same group, if you think all the way back, mm -hmm. if you were in the same book group, like for example, banking risk management, you can directly message people. And that's what I used as a business development associate. I was reaching out to people. So I started that earlier, then put it on hold for several years. And then mm -hmm. my first ever post that I think I made was when I was studying for the Tableau certification. And I think I was looking for tips, right? I'm like, Hey, people, you took this, someone took it out there and I, I privately messaged people. And then I'm like, you know, what happens if I post this as a question? Will people actually answer? My theory was no, but I decided to post the question anyway, and let people know I'm studying for this thing. A couple of people said, good luck. A couple of people shared resources, like here are some sample questions. And I think for me, that's when the power of LinkedIn got unlocked around that 2017 timeframe. I'm like, wow, people talk back here. They're helpful. They're nice. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of kept me coming back. I've, I'm also, yeah, I'm also always coming back here to LinkedIn. I don't know. It's a lot. It's very different than when you think about Facebook. I also, I created a Facebook account and everything, but I yeah. never really, I don't know the, the, the conversation wasn't, was never really there. There's a lot of stuff happening in groups and a lot of ads for this and that, and ah, I was never, yeah. so it was a good song. And for me, YouTube was the big thing. I always liked YouTube. Yeah. What Watched the Interestingly, YouTube is where I started. I didn't start on LinkedIn. So I, meaning in terms of sharing content, I started my humans of data science video podcast, which mm -hmm. when I was trying to learn about data, for those who I don't know, and I just got started, I started messaging people, just anyone who had the, the word data scientist anywhere on their profile, I would reach out and say, Hey, I want to learn about what you do. So I started getting on calls with them and I'm like, there must be other people like me who have similar questions. So I started recording these obviously with their permission and creating these 10 segments on YouTube called humans of data science with Andreas. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you were on that show at some I point. I think so. Yeah. I, I, think yeah, you I, delete, think. I think we, we were discussing and you deleted my. No, I did not delete it <laughs> on YouTube. So that's how I got started, but it, it was such a great way for one, get content out there, but two, get to know people without any pressure of, Hey, I'm looking for a job or you know, it's like real networking where you're just trying yeah. to get to know people. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, it's important. The whole branding as an expert, it, if it's YouTube or LinkedIn, I think it's very important to go out there and to yeah. position yourself as an expert. So people can recognize, okay, Andreas can help with certain things. Whenever you post, people are seeing this and they write a comment and you can help again. And yeah. That's what is, was really great. Otherwise you would just do this at work and have this at this small work bubble Yes. and, and don't reach out. So that's, I think for anyone who wants to go somewhere career wise should do that. Yeah. I see that also for my students, uh, because I now, when you apply to a job for engineers, it's not that terrible, but for scientists. You create a, you have a job ad, you apply to it. 300 other scientists are applying to the same thing, right? Yes. So it's, you need a way of standing out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And speaking of standing out, I see Scott Taylor in the audience there and I know he stands out. He's got beta pup, uh, puppets for those who, who don't know Scott. So thanks for joining. He says that you're joining from the cloud, the data, <laughs> the data cloud, Andreas. We've cloud, got yeah. people from New York, That's... Abu Dhabi, Egypt. Yes. Is that the uh, actual image? 
Oh, you I, did? I was, okay. I was searching for something for the background and then everything is not for free. You have to pay for backgrounds and so on. And so I just one you know, day there's I got a place out where and... you can where you can use images, but they might end up charging. <laughs> might... I'm going to create a video about this in a few days. Yeah, figure it out first before the video. But anyways, yeah. yes. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. Now, so just for the audience, the most important thing is if you have not started building a brand, the best time was obviously 20 years ago. The next best time is now, right? Yeah. Just like planting a tree. Start today. Start If you don't feel comfortable posting your own content, then even commenting on 10 different posts per day could be really helpful as long as they're relevant posts that you truly care about. Even me, like... There are people that I recognize because they always comment on my content. And I feel like we're friends now. Like I've never even spoken to these people, but because I keep seeing their face and name, I'm like, oh, okay, I know this person is in this community. So I think that's, that's a good way to get started before you are comfortable enough to start putting out your original content. That's true. It's also, you have to find the content that you're natural good at. If you don't, I know a lot of people don't want to create YouTube videos or something don't want to be on screen, feel uncomfortable on screen. Happens to me all the time as well. It feels strange <laughs> recording yourself, but yeah. if, if you're not happy with that, or if you don't feel good with that, then maybe a podcast or uh, write some medium articles, make it, do it in a written form, make infographics or something like that. So that's how you can you can start without putting yourself out there and yeah like, using what you're comfortable with so you mentioned that you are still somewhat uncomfortable with the video content but you put out a lot of video content so tell us more how do you get over that maybe fear or uncomfortable feeling no it's so for me the always the once the camera is rolling and once i started a few times then it's okay <laughs> but <laughs> the the hard part is for me is and that's where I currently struggle with YouTube is finding starting. Okay. You, because at some point you get into the thinking of who even cares? Why do this again? What's a good topic? I know nothing new. It's that's the, for me, I'm doing this for six years. I'm at that stage. I need to find an, a new way of doing this because yeah. Doing the tenth, how to start with data engineering video is like a... <laughs> putting a new twist on it. But yeah, I think a lot of people out there do have this sort of, okay, what do I know that maybe hasn't been said already? But you have to keep in mind, there's so many people in the world and you have a different perspective on things, right? Yeah. If you're a beginner, talk about what it's like to be a beginner. You don't have to pretend to be an expert in whatever you're talking about. Talk about how you just messed up your code and you can't fix it. And then, you know, how did you end up figuring it out and who helped you talk about that? I think it's more relatable to others in that same sort of on that same level in the journey. And that's what helped me. I, I ended up following a lot of people who were also starting out in addition to trying to follow the experts in this space, because we're on the same page, we are going through mm -hmm. the same obstacles. And I think that's why I talked to Andrea so much because we're building similar, but different enough sort of businesses, but yet we share quite a bit in common in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. It wouldn't have been as fun if Andreas was like, has been doing this for 50 years and I don't know, has retired already and has like a billion dollars <laughs> in the bank. And there I am like, how do I save $10 on this tool? Like it's, it would have been a, it wouldn't have been as interesting to, to have those conversations. So finding people at, at your level and trying to relate to them, I think is important as well. But generally the starting point, just starting out is a really cool, cool, like, how's it called? Pro, no, step of the whole journey, right? Because yeah. you can just try out stuff. Uh, I'm trying this out. Doesn't work. Okay. Let's not do this again. <laughs> and just test things out and you don't really have a big reputation to lose. Yeah. Right? If I now mess up and everybody says, oh, Andreas, how good can his academy be if he doesn't even know this and that? So yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. this That's fear true. in the background, right? That, that as a bit of a more established expert or brand, See, I, I don't like to call myself expert. expert. 
Oh my God. So speaking of beginners, I think it's good for the audience to get a little backstory of when we knew it was time for us to really start the business. So I'll let you go first. Like, when did you know that you were ready to do this on your own? Or did you always know that you wanted to run your own business? Ah, it's, it's difficult. So I had the feeling always that I want to do something on my own, but it wasn't really a, I wasn't really planning for this. So it was for me, I was doing it for fun and it was then, then COVID came around and I was sitting in my home office all day and working from home and saving a lot of time because I didn't have to travel and uh, yeah, every day, a few hours or I think one and a half hours I had left. So I was thinking of what to do with all this and people came around and it was getting more serious that more detailed questions came around and I thought, okay, let's create a, let's create a course. Let's create, let's help people. Let's do coaching for people. And so on the side, I started basically building my academy. I always, I had a, a bit of problem that I was in my old job. I was always struggling with my health a bit. And so I, at, at some point last year, I said, okay, let's, let's make a break here. Let's take a, a, a single year, a whole year off of work. And let's just do something that you're interested in, which is teaching and let's see where this leads. And so that was how I got there. I don't know if it's in, in my blood. I don't know why I like it. I know that my father at some, for 10 years had a whole department, internal training department with 30 or 40 people. So maybe I got it from him, like, you know, liking the teaching, but that's basically how I got here. And then now I made the decision to, to not go back and to do this. That's it. Time. There's no turning yeah. back now, Andreas. Plus yeah. you can always, I feel like it's a bit less of a risk once you've really established yourself because, and I remember talking about this with you maybe a year or two ago where it's like, okay, what yeah. happens if it doesn't work out? Cause obviously. The percentage of businesses that don't make it is a lot higher than those that do. And the theory was that you can always find another job if you really need it to. Not to use that as a crutch, but realistically, like that was just, that's just the reality of it. And I think that's the case for a lot of others. And it goes back to the importance of having this brand where you are confident enough that A, you could be successful, but B, if you just decide that this is not for you, you still have that personal brand to get a job. So yeah. it's not going yeah, yeah. to win, win really. Exactly. That's so you're, you have that safety of, okay, if that doesn't work out, you can go somewhere, but the right point, I think to, or let's say the other way around, people want to start too quickly, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go on social media and I'm going to start and next in the, in a few months, I'm going to quit my job that I don't like. And then I'm going to have my own company, which that's doesn't work out maybe yeah. for a few people that that works out, but it's more a long grind than a, than, yes. a, than a rocket. And, and so you have to keep that in mind. Absolutely. And but, then they give up, right? Because two weeks later, they're like, why don't I have a million followers? I post it every day. <laughs> you know, well, it's broken. Like that doesn't work. That's it. Yeah. And I do hear that. Like, oh, social media doesn't work. I tried it. Yeah. Tell me what you did. And how long you tried it for that's yeah. so yeah, it's, you have to, and that's where I'm sometimes struggling with where then I need my wife and she's stop complaining or, or, or you're saying, ah, don't stop complaining when we talk. So that where sometimes it feels like an uphill battle. Everything is it's, it takes effort and nothing comes from its own. It's like difficult. It's a fun journey and, and it's also worth it. Like you asked when is the right point to make it for me, the right that when I knew that I should try this first of all, where I saw it was fun. Yeah. My health got a lot better mm -hmm. and I saw that it pays the bills. So then the jump wasn't really that difficult to make right. because it it was good for me. It felt good for me and I can feed my family. So 
that's enough to do that jump. If that's not the case where, let's say the money point where you then think, okay, I'm quitting my job and I have to struggle and I need to desperately find a way of getting that money. That's There are less dramatic ways to start though. You don't have to quit your full job. You can start building as long as it's appropriate with your job and everything. You can at least start building the, the brand, which is, I'll share, um, I'll share my story here now, how I got started. That's exactly what happened. I, I started building the brand years before I launched the company, which was March, 2020, the official launch and start of me going full-time into dedicated where for years before that, I, I continuously shared content those years before that's when I got the LinkedIn top voice. Uh, that's when. I really built the right relationships and established myself as the person to go to for all things data, not just like data viz, but also data integration. I, I got into sort of every topic that I could in data, uh, machine learning, AI, at some point, to much to Scott's unliking even master data management, where I, I got my toes wet a little bit there talking about that. But how my journey started. I personally always wanted to own my own business. I read all of these books that are like, oh, you're in control of your own destiny. I've, I've read them since I was a teenager. I've probably read all of the best sellers on the topic of starting your own business and productivity and always wanted to be in charge of my own destiny. Even as a child, when I moved to America, I was probably nine year, nine or 10 years old when I started my first business. Before learning how to speak English, I was selling bookmarks to my, to my classmates. I would hand make bookmarks. I would like make a little braid out of yarn. So there's something that sticks out. Back then Pokemon was big. So I'd put Pokemon stickers and print out their names in the library. Cause we didn't have a computer, but even back then I knew I wanted to own my own business. I think I didn't understand all of the implications and challenges that it might come with. And obviously as your business grows, your problems grow. But I wouldn't change anything about the whole journey in terms of would I want to go back to working for a corporation? Absolutely not. I think I personally learned a lot from working at all the companies I worked for and the companies that we've consulted for. But in the end, it taught me that this is truly what I want to do. I think people who start a business right away might not even have that sort of experience, they might say, oh, it's so much easier working for someone else. And for some people that really is the case. And they do enjoy that part where they don't really have to think about what they have to do tomorrow. But that is one of my most favorite things. One, nobody can tell me what to do <laughs> tomorrow. I can create <laughs> my own hours. Like even if it means I'm up at 5 a.m. and working early morning, so I don't have to work after 2 p.m. when my kids are, but I can also create whatever I want to create. Like when I got started, I also started an academy. It was the dedicated academy. And I had a company called story by data, which later evolved into being called dedicated when I decided to streamline that and make it uh, a little bit easier for people to understand what it is I do, but it was definitely an ev evolution. Right? I started with a course on uh, data visualization and visual best practices and storytelling, got into hiring instructors to build more courses then made it into a community. Like then I started conferences and I didn't have to ask anyone. I did talk to people like Andreas and Scott, and I see, uh, Kristen there as well. Kristen was one of the original hey, office hours participants. So yeah, that's my journey in a nutshell there. I, I would also say this. So a lot of things that you mentioned are my favorite things for me. Because I've known, I've, I've worked for over 10 years in, in a huge corporation. For me, the, the cool thing is that it doesn't feel like you're working for the machine. Yeah. You're working for somebody. So for me is helping students actually learn something, helping students get a new job. That's really fulfilling for me. Yeah. So I, I don't have somebody who is telling me, Andreas, we need to do this and that because the management decided this way. Yeah. Here's the management and I'm going to decide what to do. And I'm going to find a way how to best help the students. And then when somebody comes around and says, Hey, I got a job here. I got a job there. And just, I'm making, 
I don't know what was the last one over 150k now mm -hmm. as a data engineer. Awesome. That's yeah. Like, it's you definitely get that satisfaction, right? Like you hope to make that happen. And exactly. I'm sure you're, it gives you the sense of fulfillment and joy and you get to do what you love every day, even though there are challenges and we'll get into some of the challenges. There are struggles there. You're always second guessing if what you're doing is the right thing. Cause when you're working for the machine or the business or you know, the company, you know what you're doing. Here are the five things you have to do. Okay. Go do them. I said that they're right. You're going to do them. And you don't usually question it unless you're like one of the few who really question what you're supposed to be working on. A lot of times you're like, okay, I'll get this done. When should I do it by? That's your only question. When mm -hmm. is this due? And then you go ahead and do it. When you're running your own business, you're the one, you are management, right? You are figuring out what do I have to do today? And you won't get in trouble if you don't do it, especially for things like Andreas, you create new courses all the time. No one's telling you what course to create. No one's telling you when you should create it by. So you're your own boss and sometimes, and there's different types of personalities, but a lot of times it's hard to make yourself do the things you don't want to do. There, yeah, that, <laughs> I'm struggling with this all the time, like doing stuff that I don't want to do. Yeah. Like right now I'm, I'm creating just an example. I'm creating a certification course for the Academy. I hate it. It's terrible. <laughs> It's terrible. If I could do 20 other things, I could, I, I want to do these 20 other things because somehow it's for me, it's uh, finding interesting or challenging questions, yeah. asking them, finding idiotic answers that sound like they real could be true, right? This, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm struggling, for, <laughs> but I want to finish it next week. So my dead, my personal deadline is the next week. <laughs> that stuff so it, it's not all sunshine and and i don't know how the how the yes how it's yes English and i think it's a good time for us to talk about some challenges so making yourself do the work avoiding procrastination because it's so easy to procrastinate when you're the only person in charge of yourself for me the other challenge has always been and i'm really working on it but it is delegating to others my business is now at a point where I could hire help and there are things that I can use some help in, but I still struggle with, I guess, telling people what to do and how to do it because the thinking, the logic I have is by the time I explain this to this individual, I could just quickly do it 10 times because it'll just take me less time. And I know all the benefits of hiring people. I know that that's the way you scale. And I know Andreas, you and I have spoken about this at length where I need to hire help. And I, I, I have found some people who are really good, but I think it was, I felt so much pressure in terms of making sure I give them fun work. Like, I feel like I care so much about the other person because I've been on the other side where I was given work that, okay, here, go do this thing. And I'm like, oh, I hate this thing, but I have to. Do so I'm always thinking, like, okay, what's some fun work I can give, give to this person. And it's not always the fun work that needs to be delegated. And then also just being a better manager in terms of, I need this today versus saying, yeah, get it to me whenever you can. Everything else is more important. So it's something I'm personally working on, but that's been one of my main challenges. Which I tell you for, for months now. Yes. Yeah. Someone do <laughs> yeah, so delegation, but, I know you, you have some support, right? Andreas, yeah. so you're able to delegate. But I'm struggling with the same thing because. Yeah. I have, my wife is doing the financial stuff and, and I have uh, Mira and uh, Corinna who are doing the social media and so on Yeah, with help. And for instance, the data engineering insider that we posted last week, they did a lot of stuff for this, like the email newsletter and the layout and texting. But the problem for me is also the delegation part because a lot of stuff is technical. So I need to prepare information for them, technical information that only I can prepare and then they can then create the content for this. So it's always difficult. I wish I, I had, I was at the stage where I can hire another data engineer. So somebody who, who's, who has the knowledge, who can then also feed them some information. But I'm, I'm not at that point. That's I mean, but, yeah. 
Sorry? Yeah, I was going to say you will be. I already know. You will be at that point. At some point. Let's see how, let's, I have a few ideas what to do next. <laughs> we yes. discussed. It's, it's a secret. It's but, secret. but for me, the, I struggled with two things a lot. And luckily my wife helped with that. First is the financial stuff because the whole taxes and everything, mm. the, the systems around this is super annoying. And it takes so much time with our accountants to figure out everything, to set up the systems on her computer so she can make all the, basically, uh, booking is the wrong word, that she ha is in charge of the, yeah, the, the bookkeeping for yeah. everything. And it's, it's a lot of, that. that's something that is really stressful and costs a lot of nerves. Yeah. I'm and sure. then also the legal stuff mm -hmm. for me. Because in Europe, you have to like jump through a lot of hoops and then with a lawyer and so on, creating all the privacy policies and, and yeah, so on that's, for the academy. That's the not so glamorous side of the business is figuring out, should you be an S corp, an LLC, a C corp, what tax break, all that stuff, hiring the right accountant and finding the right I think, partner yeah. for, for legal is, is just so important. I think one thing we didn't, we touched on a little bit earlier, but I know we both struggle with as a challenge that I just want to briefly discuss is the concept of focus, right? Because we are in charge <laughs> of our own destiny. We can also say, I want to do these 10 new things today instead of the thing I have to do. So I, that's something I've personally struggled with. I get excited about the new shiny object and I completely admit it. I can, I can go from okay, today I'm going to be working on my course for LinkedIn learning, or I'm working on the book for O'Reilly. And then I'm like, you know what? I think I want to put together a tools guide for data integration tools. I'm going to do that. And no one's there to stop me. No one's there to say, no, Kate, no focus. Look, you were supposed to do this. So focus is something I struggle with. How about you, Andreas? How's your focus going? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> no, it's, uh, the thing is, and uh, you're touching here on a very sensitive point here. What most people see f what we're doing is only a small part. Yeah. Like the course creation or like what I said earlier with the certificate, that's only a small part of what we actually have to do all, all day. Right? Going through emails that people send going on social media and spending an hour or one and a half hours of finding interesting stuff, yeah. commenting on people's things, making plans of where to, like what YouTube videos need to go next, scheduling meetings with potential, potential students or potential clients. Right. It's all this, like th this is stuff where sometimes I have the feeling like, oh man, I, I cannot concentrate on one thing. I'm jumping from this, then I need to do this. Then somebody asks for a discount. Then let's see if we can somehow solve this problem for this one person, make people happy, go on to the Slack. Somebody has a question on our, on our learn data engineers, go answer this Google here. And then the course creation gets smaller and smaller. And smaller. <laughs> yes, because like yourself, I also have the two kids, you have the spouse, you have the friends, the family that you need to spend time with. I also read, run, hike, bike. There's other stuff in life besides mm. the business. And it's juggling all that, like the thing you have to work on, plus the cool new things you want to work on, plus the things that you have to work on because they're the small, like you said, the emails, or you have a call coming up with the, with a company and you have to learn what they do before you get on that call. So you don't feel like you're unprepared and yeah. all of that really does take time. We have yeah. a question here from, from Heather that I liked. She's asking, first she said, how do you hold yourself accountable? And do you use any certain tools to help with accountability? Okay. Go ahead, Andreas, you first. So the, the first thing we both hold ourselves accountable, <laughs> yeah. like you, me, and, and I, you. Yes. And also what I'm using is, so a buddy is very good to have. Yeah. who's in the same situation or understands your situation. What I use with my team is ClickUp. Okay. And I think you suggested this. I started with Trello. Yes, I think because Susan, Susan Walsh, the classification guru, she suggested it to me 
-hmm. on one of our touch points. And I used it and I loved it when I was trying to have a team without three people involved. And then when I stopped having the team, I went back to using this, my notebook. So that's also something I'm using. So I'm basically having my where's the camera. Okay. I'm basically having my notebook and every day I'm writing basically down here. That's just for this year. I'm basically writing down every day. What, I, what do I want to achieve or what do I need to do? Yeah. And then I'm going there and, and then I'm saying, okay, that's yeah. good. And then, or this, no exit out this, I didn't do. And then it needs to go into the next day. Like that's also like the, your notebook. Yeah. I have my notebook and then I've got the, a little whiteboard back there. So sometimes I write down the most important things I have to work on. And then the kids come and they're like, can I erase it and draw a picture of an elephant? And I'm like, sure. Okay. <laughs> Forget the list. Go do whatever you want. But yes, it is very helpful. I was going to show my accountability tool. Okay. Here it is right there. Can you that's see me. that? Yes. That's <laughs> me. Uh, okay. Yeah. We started, I don't remember when we started doing this, but we actually started having weekly calls. It's gotta be at least two or three years ago when yeah. we officially started weekly calls and I, we barely missed any, it was gotta be like a vacation or some big holiday where we skip a week. Typically if we can't make it, we move it towards another day. Uh, but it's super helpful to have someone, especially if you don't have employees or a business partner, someone who you could just tell people like, Hey, I want to work on this. First of all, bouncing off ideas and yep. sharing the tools like click up and Andrea has given me one huge tip earlier this year in terms of what I can do with my. So it's, it's always very helpful. Yeah. Andres, that's the one thing, right? <laughs> the one thing, the only thing that I was good at. <laughs> Sorry. It was just so good. I remember clearly saying, Andres, how you finally helped me. But anyways, it's always good to just have someone who can hear out all of your stuff and know where you're trying to go. And also not someone who's your constant cheerleader. Like your best friend might say, wow, yes. You're yeah. the best. Keep going. Whereas Andreas will say, no, Kate, that's dumb. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you need that. And then you yeah. could say, you were on a mission to do X, Y, Z. Why are you now doing this? And I think that's very helpful to yeah. find an accountability buddy. It doesn't have to be like super weird and official. Hey, you want to be my buddy? It was like, I actually don't know. And I think we, we talked about this last week or, or the week before that we don't really know how we started this. We, no, we, we were don't. at the, we, we were at the data science office hours and then we, this somehow, we somehow split. Yeah. I think we had a call about something during the time we were having these office hour conversations. And what's interesting, a few others, I think Eric and Bo ended up talking to each other. And then a couple of others, Fabio and Kristen, I know worked together Well, Fabio was the other one. They worked together on some stuff. So I think data science office, uh, hours broke up, but not really. We're still yeah. there in pieces, but yes, yeah, so that was a good question, Heather. Thank you. And since we're talking about tools, I do want to share a few of the tools that I use in, in the business and Andreas, I do want to hear about some of the tools that you use in yours, but I've actually got a little graphic here. For anyone who's interested in doing something similar in terms of dedicated, and I know Andreas, as I go through this, you could tell me which ones you use and don't. Mainly I use LinkedIn for building the brand, reaching the, reaching people circle for hosting the community, as well as all the courses. I used to use teachable, which is Andreas. That's what you use now, yeah. right? For your data engineering, great tools. Webflow, I actually moved from GoDaddy to Webflow in terms of website management. You use, what do you use for your I, website? I'm basically doing two things for my website. I'm using the Wix, uh, no, I'm using the Teachable websites. Okay. We just did a, end of last year, we did a complete custom design. So mm -hmm. this is, but this is still on Teachable. I have an old website, Team Data Science, how I started. And that is on Wix.com. Okay. It's a very, it, it's also a nice tool to build your websites and it's not super expensive. And I actually started the academy there, but I then moved to, because for, for courses and so on, 
uh, teachable is is awesome. I know mm -hmm. people also do the how's that other kajabi or something. Kajabi is another one, and Thinkific I think is the other one yeah. that's pretty popular. Yeah. Oh, and Podio. Yeah, there are plenty of options out there. This is just yeah. what what I've used. Um, Camtasia for video editing. I'm doing this with on my Mac. On your Mac, with okay. Yeah, I don't have that. a Mac. I have a Dell. Okay, so. Yeah. Stop showing you often. <laughs> I've used um, using ConvertKit for email management. Um, if you got an email to join us today, likely you received it via ConvertKit. If you signed up for the session officially, the registration page was built on ConvertKit. It's also useful for tagging individuals, email sequencing, like I said, landing pages. I use that for the conference landing page as well. And I combine that with something called add event, which actually allows you to add this event to your calendar. So those two combined is for all things, live streaming conferences, but we both started out with MailChimp. Yeah. I also started with MailChimp, but I yeah. wasn't very happy with MailChimp. And then you showed me what ConvertKit can do, especially the landing pages are not a lot nicer here. Yeah. And um, simpler. So. Yeah. It's, it's also simpler, but that's actually a very good point that people should keep in mind. We were talking here about, okay, post on social media, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on whatever medium and so mm -hmm. on. Right. The problem, so you need, what you need is a mailing list. Yeah. This is, is one of the main things that you need because the problem with LinkedIn and with Instagram and so on is the algorithm. Yeah. And that's what people are annoyed by the stupid algorithm who is not sharing your stuff. So what you, what you need to do is you need to set up a mailing list and you need to get people onto the mailing list. I know it's very traditional, but it's a really, it's a great way of staying in touch with people who are actually interested in your stuff. Yeah. That that's very important. Yes. And it was actually Miko yuck. I'll have to tell her that. She's the one who told me to get an email list. I, I've had an email list, but she's the one who told me to really grow the email list. When I was on MailChimp, it was free to use, right? When you're a small business, mm, yeah. you don't want to pay money because you're like, I can reach people on LinkedIn. Why do I need an email list? And I worked very hard to keep my list under a thousand subscribers because it was free. And then I read a book and I also spoke to Nico, who's who cares if you're paying for it? You can like that list is how you use that. The list is what you use to actually send people to your live shows, to tell them about your new course, to tell them about your dedicated merch, like whatever your product is, whatever your service is, whatever the news, the content that you want to share, uh, you have almost full control over when you send what well, you have control when you send, but you have a lot more chances of your email being opened versus if you post something on LinkedIn and then. Like you said, the, yeah. the algorithm may or may not show this as something that's relevant to your audience. So definitely <laughs> email well, that list touches, only. that touches on a point that's important. Like he, all of the tools, I think it, all of the tools we use are free to use. Let's small, get into it. So let's see LinkedIn. I do pay for LinkedIn cause I like the unlimited search. Like sometimes if I'm looking for a speaker for my conference, I, I need to search and search for yeah. circle. I'm on the professional, so I do pay for that Webflow, It's almost free, meaning it's pretty, pretty cheap. Camtasia is a one-time fee convert kit, probably one of the more expensive things on the list because it, it is pay as you grow. And at this point I have a lot more than a thousand subscribers. It's still actually, I looked at it. It's still cheaper than MailChimp. Ad event mm. is a few hundred bucks a year. So it was not bad. And we were just getting to something called Canva, which is probably one of my favorite tools. This whole thing was built in Canva, by the way, a tool for creating graphics, which is, I use this yeah. for probably everything, even my book, my courses, my, my, everything is built in Canva. Canva is very important. I'm like back in the days where everything was PowerPoint, but Canva does give you so much options to do. They have templates for everything. Yeah. It's the tool uh, yeah. to use and to generate graphics. You're a lot more talented than I am in this. Uh, <laughs> Whenever I so create easy. something, it's terrible. So I, uh, very often I ask Mira, please create something because I'm useless. 
But Canva is the maybe the MVP here. Yeah, like I mean, the, the the tool that is very versatile. It is very good. And then I use Calendly. And by the way, these tools are part of the reason why I don't necessarily have to delegate to another person. I think 20 years ago, I could not do almost any of the things that I do myself with this technology. If this technology didn't exist, I would need a person for almost everything. I'd need a designer. I'd need a web designer. I'd need um, someone who can manage email, like everything, it, everything becomes simpler with this technology. Calendly is something I use for all my meetings. If there's a client interested in learning more about how to work with dedicated, I send them a link, they find a time that works for them. And since I value my personal time so much, they can only book time between 9 AM to 11 AM and then 1 PM to 2 PM Tuesday through Thursday, which is great for me because. I get to have Mondays to focus on work, Fridays to clean my house and also do the mm. things that I've been putting off all week and reading books and all that cool stuff. Uh, so it helps me really keep to my calendar. This, for me, it was Calendly was a big tool in the beginning when I started with the coaching. Yeah. Because I was starting uh, the coaching and helping people basically outside of my work schedule. So I was teaching from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. and from 10 p.m. to basically midnight for a long time. But the cool thing was the people could just go to Calendly, book, book something. Here's the coaching meeting and that's it. And then I get an information. Somebody booked something. Yeah. And even when I, I last last week, I was talking with my lawyer, send an email. We need to chat ah, here. Calendly link, boom, done. It's so much. So easier. Calendly is, is an awesome tool. Absolutely. It. Then moving on to Descript. So this is um, a tool that Scott Taylor, who I see is um, still in the audience there. He told me about this tool. Basically you can upload an MP4 file, MP3 file, and it gives you a full transcript, a very scarily accurate transcript, very quick way to edit your content. So I basically use Descript and Camtasia sometimes together, but what Descript allows you to do is when you upload, let's say, let's say this conversation after we're done, Andreas, I'm going to put this into Descript. It'll take probably 15 minutes because it's almost at an hour now in terms of content. And then it'll give me a full transcript. And let's say I wanted to cut some part out of the conversation. I can, let's say I said something wrong, like I said, Webflow, but I wanted to say Camtasia at some point. I can actually just delete that word from this transcript and then will automatically update the video yep. content without me having to find and scroll in Camtasia. Where did I say this? It's a lot easier to just edit the word, delete a whole paragraph, delete half, delete half the thing or delete one word and it will automatically update the video. So that has been so helpful in terms of creating transcripts, show notes, and just video editing in general for any little video that I need to create. You're using that. I have that actually on my computer here, but I'm not using it. Okay. I, whenever we did, for me, it was always the important part, the transcripts and I upload most of the stuff to YouTube and you can with YouTube copy paste, you can get the transcripts and give yeah. the transcripts to somebody. So that's not really a, a big, a big thing. Let's see, maybe in the future, I. Yeah, the that. transcript you can get almost anywhere. I even use Word documents, but like as Scott says, it lets you edit the video like a Word mm. document. Yeah, and that's yeah, my that's favorite true. part. That's the that's, 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 that's a cool tool. All right, moving on to StreamYard. Wow, have you heard of this too, Andreas? Never heard of it. Oh, wait, we're using it. <laughs> we're right using now. it right now. Yes, yeah, so we're using StreamYard. I actually used to use something else before. This was back in the day pre COVID when all my live streams were from my phone, because there was no way, or at least I didn't know of a way to do this virtually live streaming. So whenever people wanted to go live or be on my show, I had to meet them where they are, or we would meet up at like the LinkedIn headquarters or somewhere mm -hmm. else. Then I found out StreamYard and I've even hosted big conferences on StreamYard. I live stream to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch all at the same time. And I absolutely love it very user-friendly. So I always, I love telling people about it. Yeah. So I know I'm, you, yeah, go ahead. I started with something else. So how I started this, I can't show you, let me share my screen. Yeah, right. go ahead. You share your screen. screen. Here, you how see. I basically work, I have here my, 
I'm using OBS, Open Broadcaster Software, okay. where I actually manage all the, the audio sources and my video. And this okay. is, a, is a virtual camera that actually goes to StreamYard. You, okay, I, in the cool. beginning, I had, an, I had a, a, you can set here, setting streaming somewhere. Uh, Don't stream, break And then now. you can say here, resources or services, restream.io I used. Okay, With okay, okay. Restream.io, you can also, you can also sh share then your, your video to YouTube, to LinkedIn and so on and so on. Okay. But StreamYard is a lot nicer and easier to use like these transitions and so on. No. Yeah. Anyone I show this to, they're always like, I'm going to use this from now on. They yeah. get so excited, especially they see you could do the banners and they'll play a little video and the countdown and there's a private yeah. chat and you can that's... pull in comments like this. That's yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a... For me, <laughs> that's a great... once these expenses go for a figure, yeah. then it's, uh, I don't care anymore. Right. <laughs> so it's, if I. I need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah, you just need it. So yeah, moving yeah. on, I know we're like getting close to our time here. I'll quickly go through some of the others. So Medium, you might I have be familiar time with. Kate, by the way. Oh, you're good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Medium we use for articles. That's where I put show notes after um, the dedicated show was up. YouTube, we both use pretty extensively. I need to just get better at it. If you're not following our YouTube, by the way, guys, if you're tuning in now, go and subscribe. I'm yes. at Think We Hate It and Andreas, what is it? Learn Data Engineering? No, it's my name, Andreas Chris. Oh, go look for Andreas. See, that's confusing. I would have looked for Learn Data Engineering. Well, that's yeah. what I'm there for. <laughs> this is my value add. So look for Andreas Kretz as well. Uh, follow our cool. YouTube. Stripe is something I recently started using because um, that's how Circle processes payments, but it's basically a way to process. And then I'm, PayPal I'm, as well. Go I'm ahead. I'm actually using one more service. Okay. I'm using WISE, formerly TransferWISE, okay. because in Europe, everything is in Euro and you're in, in US dollar. Yeah. And when you go through PayPal, uh, the, the amount of money they take out for the conversion is terrible. Oh, so okay. WISE is a nice service to actually have very low fees on on conversions of, of okay, cool. Good, currencies. good to know in case I ever move to Germany or something. That's, Euros. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you never know what happens. So then Typeform, I, I started using this for surveys, but also when people were just joining my circle community, I use that as an application, but it lets you create very custom questionnaires, custom feedback forms and surveys. It actually links up with my convert kit. So if somebody fills out a survey, it will tag them in my email management system as well. And then I can have them get automatically subscribed, obviously with some disclaimers that they know that they're subscribing, but it helps keep everything in one loop. All right, Amazon. So this is where I first self-published my book. So I put Amazon on there. I also sell dedicated merch on Amazon. So the publishing plus the merch. Also got a merch shop on Spreadshop. If you want to buy dedicated swag, like mugs, t-shirts, blah, blah, blah. That's all available there. I Do you have merch? Tried this. I actually tried this out. I, ha I haven't told you <laughs> because I, I didn't have t enough time, but I, I was also thinking of these uh -huh. data engineering stuff or like funny prints on, on t-shirts or something, but I don't have the time need to focus on other stuff. So. I just created a shop, but I never put on stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. But it's pretty easy to do. It costs you nothing. If you wanted to create your own merch shop, all you have to do is create a little design, decide what products you want to put it on, give your shop a name, and then you have a That's link it. you can share with people. So it's really cool. Yeah. Very easy to use. Zoom. So my Calendly syncs with Zoom and adds a Zoom link automatically for all my calls. I also use that for the the sessions that I do sometimes within circle or for basically all my conversations, we our, our accountability calls are on zoom, for example. Yep. So zoom is just easy to use, always reliable clips. So this is, I think it's for iPhones only, but clips is an app you can use to create short video. I guess you could use it for long videos as well. Super cool because it lets you see, I see Andres is taking notes. Whenever I see that, I mean, they said oh. something he liked. <laughs> so it basically lets you create a video 
I use the Square video quite a bit because that's the platform. It's good for LinkedIn. It's good for Instagram, that uh, Square video format. It lets you record and it actually auto captions what you're saying in a fun way. You have 20 or 30 different caption styles that you can use for cool. words on screen, which is something I really recommend. If, if you're putting out video content on any platform, chances are, I don't know, at least half of your audience is going to, yep, that's the one. It's yeah, going to listen to it in, yeah. Apple, so it's free. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's free. It's free. <laughs> you can add little icons. You can do little transitions. You can cut things. You can mesh 15 videos together, change the aspect ratio. It's very easy to use. So highly mm -hmm. recommend that one. Let's see. I have something left. Yes. There's shield app. So that's this uh, little green, looks like a dollar sign, like an S. It What's gives that? you analytics from LinkedIn. So you can see, you can find your posts from a year ago versus on LinkedIn. It's pretty hard to actually find your content. And sometimes I give this to my media partnership clients where if we do a post together, I could show them here is how many views we got here, the breakdown of the regions, the companies, the industries that actually viewed the content. And they have a report of all the content we put together. PayPal, we, so we talked about and anchor is the last one. So I, I started a podcast and this is free to use basically you upload your MP4, MP3 file into Anchor and it will auto post it on Apple, on Google, on Spotify and all the other podcast places. Yeah. So it's a really nice tool. I use that when, when I recorded podcast episodes on my drive to work. Okay. So I was at some point I was basically recording two episodes or twice a day, yeah. driving to work, driving home. And then I cut this in the morning and posted it so it's anchor is really nice and it, it it has been bought by spotify so okay it's actually a spotify company now all right there you go hey george had a cool question here you go first andreas what would you like to do more of every day for me i would like to do more coding every day okay like developing new courses sitting here and like just with, <laughs> with music and like developing stuff that's something i miss sometimes so yeah okay yeah i think for me yeah. it would have to be designing things in canva that's the time when i'm like in my flow where i'm like okay Ooh. starting from a blank screen i want to show this and this and then i could do it however i want there's no you have to use these colors or do this so i think letting myself be creative sometimes it can take minutes, sometimes hours for me to create one little piece. It's kind of painting, I guess, for me, but it gives me this, and it goes back to like me wanting, want, liking data visualization more than anything else. And even before that, when I was a consultant creating PowerPoint, I was, that was something I was pretty good at in terms of designing really good looking PowerPoints. So I think it, the things that you want to do more of are sometimes the things that you're really good at. So you must be a really good coder then. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I'm not the best, but I, I, I'm, I'm decent. Let's, let's say. So Heather says her favorite part is Canva design time. Woo, I love it. Okay. Nice. As we wrap up, Andreas, I want to ask you if you were starting from scratch right now, let's say today's the day you decided to leave your company and meaning leave the company you work for, and you want to start your own business. What would you do? Would you do anything differently? How would you go about it? So two things that are very important. One thing is the right platform where you create the content. I would start, I think I would start with TikTok right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's not we too were, late. It, Kate is laughing because we were talking a lot about TikTok and she's always create your first TikToks, create yeah, your do first it. TikToks. And I'm like, Ugh. you know what? That's how people are watching us right now. We would say post on LinkedIn. They're like, oh, LinkedIn. <laughs> so that's something I would do now. Okay. Uh, otherwise the content creation part, the helping people part, I would do the same, exactly mm -hmm. the same. It was very, it was a lot of fun. It was very fulfilling, helping people. Focus is very important, as you said. For me, the one thing that really turned or gave me a boost was 
understanding that you need to price, you need to have a product. Yeah. People need something to buy because if you want to make it full time, you need to have something to buy. Yeah. And this needs to be priced more on the higher side than on the lower side. And for me, when I started out, the coaching was something where I said, okay, I, I saw, okay, that was, there was a lot of work. Yeah. But it made it, it made me able to afford helpers, afford a new computer whenever I needed, afford all these tools that we're talking. So that's the important part. Right now I'm at the part where I, where the coaching did what it needed to do. I have the academy automated. I used the hundreds of hours of coaching to tune the academy, to put the right stuff in it. So luckily it, this right now works, Yeah. but that's, that's something I would still do the same, but with a social media platform, maybe differently, maybe not on YouTube, maybe on, on TikTok. Interesting. Interesting. I think I, I have some similarities in, in terms of the platforms. If I were starting from scratch right now, no followers on any platform, I think I would still stay on LinkedIn. It would be YouTube, TikTok, and Medium. I think those are the four that I would go hard on. And what I regret not doing is as I was growing, I should have grown on multiple platforms where I think I focused mainly on one. And I know a lot of times that focus is the reason that you're growing, but it would not have been too difficult for me to also, let's say, take my blog articles and put them on Medium to help them grow or mm -hmm. shooting a short video for TikTok on what I'm working on. And I have started it. So I'm ahead of Andreas in the sense where I've actually put TikToks out there. I think it is the future. And I think it's something that we all need to keep an eye on because TikTok is at the place where now people are saying, oh, I would never put content on there. That's for kids. And hey, hey, hey. back to what Facebook was, oh, I would never put content on there. Instagram. That's for high school kids or college students. That's how it started. But these platforms have a tendency to evolve and go mass. And I think right now everyone's using all of these platforms for purposes that were not the intended purposes or not that we thought that's going to be used for. So yeah, that, that's also a regret for me on Instagram. When oh yeah, Instagram I forgot Instagram. Was hot. That's there too. And when you had reach on Instagram, it was actually nice. I should have done a lot more on Instagram back in the days. Nowadays, I, you cannot grow Instagram. It's, it's <laughs> useless. You, you can post stuff. Nobody sees it. You use the right hashtags. You're not this useless. You need magic sometimes. When, yeah, or, when or, here, yeah. or deep pockets yeah. to, to make it everything in ad and post the ads. So people yes. actually see it. So, but oh, that's... Yeah, I know. I don't want to. I don't want to use ads. I want people to watch my content because they want to. That's and then in terms of pricing, I definitely agree with you. When I first started out, I underpriced the business so much that, I mean, everyone who would see my offerings, they would just say, okay, yeah, that sounds easy enough. Yeah. I could just, can I pay you now? And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. And in the beginning that was really good, but then I ended up being so busy and not making enough money that I could not invest in the right tools. I could not hire the right people, which I'm still looking for the right people that I will eventually hire. But I was more stressed out and I, I had a lot less time because I was trying to work with everyone for this lower cost. What happened when I raised prices to a level that I am more comfortable with, I ended up working with the clients that were interested enough in my services that they were like, okay, this is worth what we're looking for. And I think that was a big game changer for me because now I can actually deliver a lot more value to those fewer clients. Now I have better tools. Now I have just more time to dedicate and come up with creative ideas of how we get, how, how to position them as thought leaders or how to get uh, more eyeballs on whatever it is they want to put eyeballs on. So. It's definitely something to think about when you're starting out. Don't be afraid to charge what you think it's worth. Don't sit on that lower end side because companies sometimes would also, and people will also think that if you're priced a lot lower, you might not be as good. 
that's just human nature. If this yeah. strawberry is a penny and this one's a dollar, the one for the dollar is just going to taste better. It's just going to be probably yeah. so much better. That's oh, but I think that has something to do with when you start out, you feel like, ah, am I giving the right value to people? Yeah. Is this worth it? So that you, you tend to, to like charge lower, mm -hmm. but that's not the, that's not what's going to, what's going to help you in the long run yes. or, or even at the beginning, because you need to have that, that cash to actually be able to do something. And right. it's all about experimenting, right? Let's say you, you end up raising your rates and you end up having no clients for six months. Maybe you raise them too much. There's such a thing as well where you overvalued it. And that's the beauty of managing your own business. You can go back and find a price point that is more fair or offer discounts to make it um, easier to yeah. actually sell your, your product or service. We were talking with my academy about this. I, I set a price in the beginning for the academy and the sales were very low yeah. because I priced it very high. Then I, then I basically split the price in half and added more and more content where the people are, then it took off, people were buying a lot. And then now I'm in the thing where I know I would actually need to price it higher, yeah. but I feel like if I price it higher, then uh, it's people like I want to help as many people as possible, right? With yeah. something like the Academy where they can go on and can, I, they don't need me directly. Yes. So this is also something where the conscience then comes into play. Like, ah, do I really need to do that? And yes, but yes. I think it's, it's natural at some point I need to raise it again and again because there's coming more and more content, but it's the, yeah. the pricing is always. It's, it's always something you're, you're thinking about. And, and now yeah. those who are watching, now you guys know what, what happens on a weekly basis with Kate and Andreas. These are all the things we talk about. <laughs> Pricing tools, like just Ideas. like what's working, what's not working platforms yeah. that we need to be working on. We, every week we say, we're going to do more on YouTube and guess what? We don't really do more on YouTube, but we try, but this was some behind the scenes footage for anyone who is curious about how we started our companies, some of the challenges, some of the favorite parts from least favorite parts, as, as well as the technology that sits behind the businesses. Andreas, right. anything else you want to say before we wrap? No, all good. I don't want to make this a, a advertisement. So no, <laughs> it was, it was fun, it was fun chatting with you yeah. as always. Yes. Um, Follow I, Andreas. If you're not following him already, learn data engineering.com to actually go and check out his academy. There's no more coaching. Don't ask him about coaching. Yeah. There's cool new yeah. stuff coming it, out. Stay tuned. <laughs> it was a hard, st a difficult step to stop the coaching. I, <laughs> I, I just like it, but it's, yeah, I think we too talked a lot about it. It doesn't yes. make sense from a business standpoint, but. And you can, yeah. that's the beauty of it. If a year from now you decide to do it, you can just do it again. Exactly. I'm the boss. I'm the You're the boss. Again. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys got some value out of this. Good to see some friends in the chat. That was nice. Stay dedicated and I will see you online. All see you right. later, everybody. Bye. Bye.